Call to order. Those opposed? Kind of clear. Uh, approval of minutes. If you guys have had a chance to look at the minutes the last couple of times. Okay. So moved. Second. All those in favor? I guess the uh, next item on the agenda is to move right into the financial statement. And, and I know you've just, from last time, you left your hanging, so I'm sure. <laughs> Couldn't wait to come back to talk to us. Couldn't wait to come back. These uh, financials are on the finance department website, and they're as of December 2017. Uh, we're doing pretty good so far. Normally, after six months, we should be about 50% spent collected. We're about 57% spent and about 85% collected. This. Uh, um, uh, there's a bit of that going on. Um, the expenditures mostly relate to the county tax because we pay 100% of that up front right after our tax collections come in. And the other piece is we pay all of our principal on our debt in October and November and then one interest payment. So we'll make the second interest payment in May. So that has something to do with it. Also, we did receive... Uh, because of the tax reform, folks wanted to pay their March payments in December so they could take advantage of the 2017 tax deduction on their income taxes. Uh, however, they also found out that they couldn't prepay next year's property taxes. So uh, some folks who did do that are asking for refunds. So uh, not, not too many, but uh, so we're, we're in the process of doing that also. I mean, do you have a, a general idea? I mean, are we talking like tens of thousands of dollars, or are we talking just a few people with, I mean, how much of that? And what does that do to the rebate side? What does that do? Is there any what, procedure or anything that we got to worry about? Or, I mean, it's just a straight refund kind of thing? It's just a straight refund. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's going to be a huge deal for us. Okay. Right. So, for example, at the end of December, we were at about 222000 prepaid. At the end of this December, we're 271,000, so just about 40,000 40, higher. And I don't think the refunds are going to that much. So um, the other piece I wanted to bring up on the balance sheet is it has to do with our tax collections in general. Even though our commitment was about 2.3 million higher than last year. We're approximately 1.1 million better collected. So I don't know how to say that in a different way, but so you know, last year we outstanding was about 30 million. Right now we're at about 29 million. So we're about a million dollars better collected. Uh, page one. Uh, at the top of your asset is the second. So I think that says well for the town of Scarborough citizens that they're. Uh, keeping up with their tax collections. Of course, some of this might have to do with those prepaid taxes as well. And were you able to do anything? Probably not much interest with the markets. Yeah, there. interest rates aren't doing that yeah. well, right. So then, um, onto our revenues. As I said, we're about 85% collected. That's on page three. And some of the reasons have to do, as I said in my summary, is that um, some of it has to do with, uh, I don't know what it has to do with. <laughs> Let me see. Hold on a minute. <laughs> We're that good. So We're that gonna, good. Yeah. Excise taxes are about, after December we should be, well, I looked at February. After February, we should be about eight months collected, or 67%. Right now, as of last Friday, we are at 67%. So everything else we collect from this point forward puts us that much more ahead. And that's 67% of our budget, not 6 because we always budget, but the projections hit usually a little longer than that. Right. Or so so we're, we're on track for our excise taxes. Our licenses and permits are up as well. I, um, the intergovernmental revenues, as I stated, has to do mostly with betting and the timing of that revenue. Same with, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, 
the charge for services are also up, and I think, as I mentioned, I think it has to do mostly with public works and them taking on more um, vehicle maintenance of other communities and then paying us for those services. And can you remind me again, miscellaneous revenues, I know it's catch-all for a bunch of stuff, but... Um. It's a catch-all for a lot of things. Um, interest revenues are in there. Sale of vehicles, sale of property are in there. I'm trying to think of what else. If well, we... Yeah, I mean, I, I just, we have less collected, but we have a higher expectation. Uh, some of that has to do, we also, if uh, if someone is injured or you know, a vehicle accident or a claim, we pay those out of our expenditures, the revenues come in, so okay. it could be that we had a higher reimbursement last year than we did this year. That's something okay. else that might be in there. And mm -hmm. then... Sorry. On page two, I'm just a little slow. <laughs> And I, I'm still back at your executive summary, but on page two, and you also talked about the executive summary, can you talk a little bit on your note number 56, legal fees are almost double what they were? Yeah, I saw that. Um, I and, believe, go ahead. No, no, just, you know, sort of the reason why, where are we going to be, and are we fully, have we, are we fully accrued for legal fees today, or is there more? I think that's going to depend on what happens with uh, the tax abatement process with the beaches. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the bulk of what's causing the legal fees right now. However, all the other accounts for legal seem to be on track. It's just what's the total legal fees comparison to the total budget? Uh, we budget one hundred and five thousand, and we've actually spent. Yeah, we spent more than that. <clears throat> With respect to the tax bill cases, the two things we do know uh, coming right up um, early next month, we have mediation. That's, that's going to be one day, um, a couple thousand bucks probably. And then, uh, depending on the result of that, if, it, if the matter isn't resolved, then uh, the board session review is scheduled to meet in April. So there'll be some prep time. Um, I don't want to fill a number on that, but it's it's fairly defined work at this point. Are those accounted for on a per issue basis, or are they one lump sum? There's legal fees going to the pot, and do we do we account for like what issue, you know, dollar values associated with sure. you know the property tax abatement, or, or some other issue or something? On like that? the invoice right. itself, it does say that. Okay. We have uh, three or four accounts under legal, you know, one okay. yeah, litigation account. Or so litigation. we have our own uh, way to categorize, but Bernstein Shore has a very detailed way. Sure. Uh, okay. So we can tell you depending what okay. the bigger matters cost us. Okay. Good. So, so the budget's 105. Do you think we we're ahead spent. year to date? But are we going to be at 105? Or are we we spent more? so far in fiscal through the end of December. We spent almost 76,000. Last year, we overspent the budget by 75,000. And that's for all legal services. That's, that's federal. That's right. And then can you just go? I'm sorry. No, no, I just want to make sure I understand. So the budget's 105, we spent 76. So we're not double. We're, we're still less than budget. Than what we we're below budget. So oh, okay. as long as All no, right. but we're higher yep. than our 50%. Yep. yep. So okay. at this point, you're saying at this point in, in the year, we're double where we were at this point last That's year. True. And there might be you know, something to watch. Yep. 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 The last three or four years, we've absolutely blown our budget. Yeah. Spent a lot more legal than we budgeted for, for sure. So maybe you got to it's, it. It looks as though, based on the trending so far and what we can expect, particularly with tax bills, because that's been the that's been the expensive one. Uh, hopefully, the end is in sight in terms of those costs. And I just have to add because I know a couple of years we've questioned whether we have enough money in the budget. So as we approach another budget cycle. Um, but just so I'm sorry, just one clip though. Any kind of settlement comes out of a different fund that doesn't count for these, right? Well. So if we have a settlement, like for example, when we when we when we authorize the four hundred thousand whatever was for, the, for we authorize the payment for the property tax rebate, right? That would come out of a separate fund that doesn't show up on legal fees, right? But the legal fees do, right? The lawyers' fees, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. But yeah, the total no, cost, no, 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 that's a no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. And just just so I know, just so we know how we so in your second paragraph of the executive summary, mm -hmm. do I understand this right? The the unassigned fund balance was six point one. 
16 and it's 6.9 in year end 17. Correct. Right. And what, how is that, do you know how that was approximately, so that's surplus, right? It's Basically? Correct, right. yes. Was it, do we know how it was split between, approximately no. how it was split between the school and This is just kind of. It's us. It's just us. Well, that's just us. The school's fund balance we, we consider reserved because technically right. we uh, can't. Okay, that's that's designated. Wow. That's designated reserve. So we got a huge lift. And that's a function of um, doing very well with excise collections, so we, uh, we yeah. exceeded budget there. Um, there's also a number of departments that underspent, if you will, and public safety was a couple hundred thousand bucks alone. So it's a combination of um, not spending as much as was budgeted and bringing in more revenue than expected. Was some of that the constraints you found? Did, did you I think curtailment had something to do with it. Um, I think the big savings in public safety was challenges with finding, uh, with bringing employees on. They were funded for them. Uh, they had trouble through recruitment, um, finding the right people um, when they expected they, they would. So there's been some savings. The, the, I think uh, when we get to our fourth quarter with the curtailment, we'll probably see more expenditures this year than we did at that same time last year, so uh, that might be something we'll want to watch. Okay. For, um, in terms of, of that second paragraph, the, with the new uh, fund balance policy, we should mm -hmm. be roughly about 7.7 .7 million. So we're a little bit below where we need to be. We're at about 8.8%, so we're still above the, the, the bottom. Remember, you just raised that yes. bar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Minimum is 8 3 goal It takes some goal standards for us to reach that. Okay. So we're at 8.9, so that's... Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Nope, that's fine. And then under the expenditures, are, are there any other questions on the revenue? I think I'm on yeah, my page on this one. So the expenditures, as I mentioned, the legal fees are, are up. We have some uh, adjustments between departments. We move purchasing out of finance and over to uh, manager's budget, assistant manager's budget, so there are some adjustments between those two. Hiring staff was another cause for quite a bit. Some of it was uh, we spent less because we didn't hire the person until later on. Fire and police staffing costs with new positions and things are the, reason, are the cause for those increases. The MIS uh, IT department, computer department, purchased a number of packages this past year, see Click Fix. We went to Google. So those increased their IT costs this year over last year. Are those one-time purchases or are they licensing agreements? They're licensing agreements. So we can expect that increase moving forward. Correct. The uh, Community Services Director, Todd Sousa, has been working very diligently to try and conserve costs and he's been doing more in-house work and as a result of that he hasn't spent as much money on contracted services so we've seen a decrease in, in their budget expenditures from the prior year. That's particularly the lawn maintenance, turf maintenance. How's he coming along with the fee analysis that he was going to do complete? Remember when he first came along we talked about fees? that we'd be able to see some type of analysis as far as where we are. I think he's evaluating <coughs> excuse me, all of that as part of um, his budget, budget yeah. preparation. Um, I'm not aware what piece he'll be proposing to change. Uh, that's always a delicate conversation. We don't want to price ourselves out of the market, uh, but we're certainly sensitive to that. There was also, um, I think they were looking at the shared services model with the school. Uh, where do they stand with that? Of, you know, they were trying to determine what, who was getting what for the exchanges and who was responsible for what, who was paying for Yeah, what. Ruth and I did a fair amount of work on that uh, two or three years ago. His kind of new perspective, new set of, set of eyes has been helpful to that, but it continues to be a work in progress in terms of really quantifying um, identifying what those shared services are and then attributing a value to it. Mm -hmm. and I, I did talk to Todd over oh, the past couple weeks and uh, one of the things we kind of talked about was maybe not doing anything change-wise per se, but to start tracking what those costs are and trying to put a value to them as they're happening so we're not sitting, you know, a year later saying, what did we do? Right. So he's working on doing something to that effect so that he'll have some better numbers in the end. 
Yeah, and part of that will help us in school because I think they feel as though the town's making out better yeah. in our church services or we are, and we'd like to kind of put some details around that. I'm not sure if we can ever get exact. What I am quite sure of is the taxpayer benefits, that the shared service helps the bottom line. Which side of the ledger, which budget it appears in, uh, is certainly a matter that we can always work on and further refine. Um, we'll just be able to be able to quantify that. I mean, it, it, obviously, in theory, we, we know that's the case because that's what we're doing, but to be able to point to it and say, you know, we use, we, you know, we're doing the maintenance on the fields, it cost this much. If you did it, it would be why? Yeah, and we, we did that, uh, you might recall, we adjusted some of the people spending numbers because mm -hmm. I think the legitimate criticism was we know some of the costs that the school aren't shown on the school side. So we utilized it as best we could for, the, for Scarborough. Um, presumably those sorts of situations exist in other districts, so um, it was interesting it didn't change the ranking at all. The numbers changed slightly, but it didn't fall this mm -hmm. couple hundred bucks a student or something. Yeah, um, and I can dig that out and share that with you again. Um, no, I, and I think... Because uh, I think that was a little bit of a question that came up in the joint finance committees about the school really feeling that they were somehow being disadvantaged in that process and really wanted to talk about who gets the fees and who gets the revenues. And felt the same way. So I yeah, I'm going to get to the bottom. <laughs> but I suspect I suspect that might come around again. So yeah, yeah. great question. Uh, the last couple of items are. Public works spending, the painting line is the uh, the major reason I believe that that line, their budget is so high in spent compared to last year. And for whatever reason, the, the vendors that do the paving weren't ready to do that painting back then. Apparently they're gone home this year. And we do have a new contractor, Pike Industries is our yes. a selected contractor who frankly has um, more capacity. So I think yeah. Mike, there were some old money, budget monies that have been carried over CIP projects. Uh, he did a lot, like three quarters of a million dollars in paving uh, in the last construction season, if you will. Probably saw the results of that around town. Um, kind of clearing out prior authorizations that had just been lingering and needed to be spent down. And we took advantage of good, good pricing with our contractors. And then the capital equipment, the last one that I would talk about is, I think, had to do mostly with uh, we kind of held departments off from spending until we had a, an approved school budget in case things changed with the process. So I think that will probably catch up as the year progresses. <coughs>
your kind of show, whatever yeah. you would like to do with this. Uh, you had a couple of directions from October 31 that have been addressed in this draft. Yeah. Um, one of them being on that first sheet, that debt policy statements for indicators one through six, and it, an additional indicator has been included, that's number five, that external looking, outward facing, how do we compare to others with our, our debt per capita number. Um, and then within the document itself, very, very few changes. Um, one of them was just to get rid of the language regarding advanced fee fundings, as that's no longer allowed by federal law. Gone, gone. That's gone. gone. So, um, did, did he think they were going to reintroduce that? Didn't he, say, didn't he have some hope that it would you know, revisit? Heard that there doesn't seem to be much hope of that happening. Right. Apparently, yeah. the IRS has always been looking askance at uh, tax exempt borrowing, and that was. I think seen by many on the inside as some of the most egregious complaints they have. So I'll be shocked, at least in the near term, you ever see that come back. Gone, what gone, were the gone. complaints that they were just there? The fees were piling up for the refunds? I mean, what, what would be the challenge for that? I can't even articulate what, what the policy objections were, but I think taxes exempt borrowing has been increasingly under the microscope. Um, and the advanced refunding was really viewed as something that should be frowned upon. But just so on, but that's not unique to a municipality, though, right? I mean, no, right. No, it's it's the tax. tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. At the end of the day, it's, it's the tax free bonds to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I guess the that's, IRS wants. It's, uh, it's not just municipalities, there are other non profit, you know, yeah, sure. no, no, they tax free bonds or what? Yeah, these um, assisted living facilities like Pipe of Shores and there's all kinds yeah. of them. I mean, they can, they're all subject to or eligible for tax exempt bonding as well. Yeah, I just, I, I hate it to get penalized for getting, we're losing tax revenue from a state or federal level, and now we're, we're lost flexibility. Well, current refunding will still be available yeah. to us, so yeah. we'll right. take a look every yeah. time we're going back to the market to see if there's right. any of our current debt held that um, mm -hmm. we can work with. Another thing, as I said, one of the type of shows is for profit, so we're on the executive, but I deal with some down in New York County that are tax exempt. I'm also not 100% sure that those folks even really understood the whole advance refunding. That they are I'm not sure. And frankly, it also could be as simple as I know one of the big goals of the Trump administration was to simplify the tax code. This part of the tax code was eight inches thick or something. I'm not sure I'm exaggerating, but I think they were able to simplify things uh, considerably. Yeah. Okay. So that's gone. That's gone. Gone, gone, gone. That, that language is it's gone. Yeah. So I think the, the big thing is just to, um, I guess, if you're asking for where I, I would like some direction about, um, so I've proposed these metrics. Some of them I have tossed in an X for like X percent. Um, one of them I've tossed in at 125 percent as an example of what could be used. And then I've given you a bunch of questions for the external facing debt per capita metric, that's number five. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge, of course, anytime that we wish to compare ourselves with others is who do we use as a comparison point? Do we want to use, so I've, I've given you some, some questions there. Yep. And um, just in Maine, New England, only in York and Cumberland County, if we do look in Maine, only those towns that are adjacent to us, or should we be looking based on population size? Should we be looking at based on assessed value or assessed value per capita or median income per capita? There are lots of different um, measures that you could compare Scarborough to and all of them could be equally justified. So I think choosing that cohort um, is important and the process of choosing it is important so that we can say to not just your fellow council members now but also to future councils as well as to the general public, this is why we chose this cohort. And, these, and it's not about the town, like a town could fall in or out of the cohort, but based on these parameters. We've decided that these are the, the parameters we're going to use to judge a, a cohort member's um, right to be in the cohort, and we will, when we're doing the annual assessments, assess if each of those towns still fits that set of parameters. And that way, it's, um, it avoids any potential argument of cherry picking, right? That we're not just looking for communities that we want to compare ourselves with. If we set those parameters very clearly, that it has to be within X percent of our population, X percent of our valuation, X percent of our median household income, that those are ways to really make sure that we're looking at comparable communities. One, one wrinkle that I, I was struck with Joe Cotero, our financial advisor, I think made the point, perhaps when he was with you last, um, you know, the differences of a growth community where we're 
constantly trying to meet the new demand of services, whether it's brand new schools or building a, a facility for the first time, that's dramatically different than an older, more established community that's already made that investment maybe decades ago or 50 years ago for that matter. So that just adds a little wrinkle to the compare, uh, the challenges of comparison, uh, comparing community to community. So I'm not sure where you've, I, I asked you some questions today, yeah. you know, and I, I was focused on, and, and, and just on bullet four, which really starts to talk about debt per capita. And you've introduced this notion of debt per capita as a percentage per capita income. And your recommendation was about 15%, right? Not uh, to not exceed, exceed, not to exceed. And that's a Moody's mark. That is considered a warning sign for Moody's if you have that ratio exceed 15%. So we would not want to we would not want to hit 15%. Currently, um, as of today, the debt per capita for Town of Scarborough, and that includes the recent $19 million issue, is $5,242. And that is using the um, American Community Survey, which is a branch of the, the census, 2015 population data. So it's, it's what, 52 what? 5242. Um, so we actually, again, we talked many times about the challenges per capita, right, is that you're yeah, having to use yeah, right. old population data. Yeah, so yeah. Um, we would expect that actually to be a little lower based on true 2018 population, but we're using 2015 population because that's the most recent um, defendable number I have. Um, and so that 15% number, as of if we were to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm incorrect. Um, <laughs> so that's why I got in number, No, if, in number six, okay, I say that yeah. that 15% would be 6,021 mm -hmm. would be the per capita debt, that, that, that per capita as a percentage of per capita. At 15, that's the, at that's 15. the limit. But that would we're be at, at, at 5242. So the limit of that is 6021. And, that's and we're at 5242. And that's what you've got listed in that number six bullet. Okay. So, I've, and that number four, so I've said debt per capita will be assessed every five years using capita, per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income with a goal of not having this ratio exceed 15%. But the second half of that says on an annual basis, debt per capita will be reported as part of the annual review of fiscal health indicators. And that I'm suggesting as a policy statement, and this is of course up to entirely for you guys to decide what you think of this, New debt issuance will be discouraged if the new debt will result in debt per capita exceeding, and I've just tossed in as a placeholder, 125% adjusted for inflation of base year 2018. That 125% um, actually runs up against and is inconsistent with that, that number 6, 15% right. measure. So 125% would actually bring us to 6,553. The um, 6021 limit of that, fifth, I'm sorry, all these numbers are being thrown at you, but um, that 15% um, not to cross line brings us that 6021, which is 115% of where we are right now, just as a guideline for when you're talking. If you like that idea of, of putting a policy statement that puts in a percentage indicator, 115% um, would bring you to that 15%. So I, I, I have concerns that I've always had with the per capita, uh, and that's now that we're starting, now that we know the data is skewed, we're basing that skewed data on hard numbers now, and this is what I was concerned with, is that we were going to build on inconsistencies and inaccuracies and put hard stops in place where they're, depending on when we do the population census, will skew the numbers to some extent. So I, I'm, I, I mean, I'm concerned with putting hard stops in there, because it's not, in my mind, it's not a, it's not an, it's not as accurate. It might be accurate in the year of the census, but for everything we've talked about before, as we get farther out there, it, it becomes a skewed number. So I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable leaving the statements in there, but I would suggest either we take out the, 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 the lead, the, the, the percentage excess limits, or certainly at the very minimum qualifying statement somewhere in there for future counselors to look at that and say, we know that there are shortcomings with this calculation based on the distance you are from the actual population census. Because I want some kind of qualifying statement there because I'm afraid, you know, in three or five years or whatever, that someone's going to look at that and that's a hard number without having the benefit of saying, well, it, it is, there are some nuances to it. As a, as a hopeful point, 
um, as of 2020, which still feels quite a ways out, um, the town of Scarborough, the 2020 census should put the town of Scarborough over 20,000 residents, which will then shift us from an every five year update to an every three year update. Mm -hmm. So that will help alleviate some of that angst. A little, mm -hmm. you know, I think that certainly qualifying language is, is always a good choice, but um, that will help to alleviate some of those challenges when we get that three year mark. And then to, to get to Chris. To Chris's point, there's there's no there's no way to make a reasonable sort of based on other data that we have what that census change might be in between measurement points. We have we have a number of different ways that we can forecast what the population yeah. is um, based on building permits pulled for yeah. the residential. So we absolutely can um, do estimates. The economist in me doesn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> so no. they just if if but. I will, of course, do as you ask. I can give you, the, but the challenge is then you also need to identify how you're going to forecast because you can forecast in different ways and come up with very different numbers. So, so it really is a challenge. I mean, I guess, you know, I hear you about it. It's not perfect. Yep, yep. But part of what I passed out, too, is just what, at least what Moores and Cabot had sort of given us a while ago about things they do look at. And so they, they put everybody sort of into a bucket. I hear there are limitations. I think I don't know the answer. I think we do need to have the discipline of some type of hard stop because I think we need to force ourselves to really think about what's going to go into the operating budget versus the capital budget. And and so I, I don't know how we do that. Well, um, I, and, I, and I am sense, I guess, and the other thing I'm sensitive to is, you know, I, I think, and I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, just where we are as compared to other communities for a debt per capita, but certainly it's something some of our community members are interested in. And so I think we need to discipline ourselves in some way that yeah. there, there, there is some, and it, you know, a, a, another council can certainly change and update the policy as we go along. But I, I think part of our point was we just want us to think more about debt per capita and what we're doing. Absolutely. And, I, I, and maybe, so. maybe, a good, maybe a good compromise would be, I mean, I'm, like I said, we can leave those four and six in there. Uh, maybe we put the hard stops on number three because that's that's a that's more of a of a, a accurate uh, measurement for lack of a better word. So it's it's a question. It's not a question of whether we're putting the stops on and putting limits on. It's it's what we're what we're measuring against those stops and those limits. You know what I mean? I guess. And my concern isn't. It's not that I don't think we should look at debt per capita. My concern is just the, the inconsistencies or the, the inaccuracy of the number over time. I'd rather, I'd rather have it be something that we can hang our hat on every year consistently and say this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it. Um, so maybe we look at, at number three for a hard stop. Just a thought. Because I think that's, I think that's from our past discussions, that's something that's, that's more accurately calculated on a year-to-year year -year basis. So is that the equivalent of... That is on the s'mores and cabot less it's the last measure, right? The two point nine six percent. That as a percent of market value. That's that's apples to apples, right? Yep. And we are currently at two point five two with that number. And state law allows us to go to fifteen, I believe. So even on this, that measurement? Yes. yes. Total. It's remarkable. Yeah. I think it's seven hundred and fifty million dollars in debt held would be craziness. Why are they meeting that? <laughs> I'm kidding. Strike that from one. I mean, from one, I mean, from one perspective, you're right. right. I mean, right. If we stay at below the three percent, which is what's proposed here, or keeping it around no, below three percent, that's the low end of that of that of that particular metric. Yeah, and I, I mean, like I said, I don't mind putting hard stops in, but I think that's that's something that's more easily calculated, I guess. You know, I mean, more accurate. So what 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 is three percent of equalized value? So let's um, our current equalized value as far and so that is going to be the what we assess ourselves at, not the full state valuation is what I would say. So let's say that we are at about three point nine billion, three point eight billion. So what does that make? Three point I don't know how to zero speak. So if if you looked at the, the next page. Where are you at? That's the state assessed. Oh, that's big assessed value. But yeah. that will get us order of magnitude. But it'll kind of give us an idea. So one percent of that would be. Um, I'm so bad at the decimal thing. What is one? So four hundred million. No, I can't remember. No. Four million? No, I can't remember. That's four million. Forty million. 
So three percent would be 120 million. And we're so our now current debt level is 102. 102. As of today, it was up 10265. I mean, I, I, at least you know, like I said, you, I mean, you're right that future <coughs> council could change that that percentage. But um, I'm I'm. I mean, I think I'm comfortable with a three percent stop there as a start starting point. And if it you know, if it starts bumping up against that, and another council has the political will to change that, then right. more power. Yeah, always can, no matter what. Right. right. And it, to support that, if not support that, sorry, that's not the right word, but to um, help frame that within some of the other metrics. <laughs> Good catch. Thank you. <laughs> um, Good catch. If you were to let's imagine that you were to say 3% is the hard stop, yeah. we are not exceeding 3%, yeah. that would be, with an estimated 20,000 yeah. members, community, 6,000 per capita in debt, which is below that 15% hard stop in the per capita debt as a percentage of per capita income. So you'd still be meeting any sort of um, requirement that you gave to yourselves in number six as well. So they're pretty consistent. They kind of back they match back, nicely because of our population. The same numbers. Yeah, because we could be in a town. So like York actually has a slightly higher value than us. So using that um, total debt as a percentage of the of the value um, in York would be a higher value, but their population is so much lower that they would not be able to then meet that fifteen percent value. So we're actually kind of a neat place where we can do both of those things and have them look enough. Um. I agree with the entire conversation. The issue comes down to is what what are we going to use this for, and how are we going to react to it when we start bumping up against those numbers? Personally, and the number five, I I think that there is a subset to that, and that is you need to look at the um, voter approved debt. Um, that is the component of that, and it needs to be brought out of it. What do you, what do you mean? On the bonded the bonded issue? Bonded issue voter approved. approved. Public safety buildings, schools, things that the voters approve. And what's your what's your rationale behind that? Because it's that's that's the decision the people of our citizens. If they said yes, then it's yes, and then we take it into consideration. I'm just saying it's a subtext. I'm not disagreeing yeah, yeah, yeah. with any of the comments around the 125. Whether that's the right number or not, it's all about what are we going to do with it when we bump up against it. Yeah. And I think that's where you then look at what are the subparts of that. The subpart is there is a component that is voter approved, in which the citizens told us that they wanted us to spend that money, and you should look at that. Well, what, so to move this, oh, I'm comfortable so, with that. Okay, okay. The, with yeah, assistant so, manager's presentation, absolutely. Okay, and I'm comfortable so, with the 125 because I don't look at it as being hard because it's an analysis tool. It's not. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I mean, I, I like I said. I guess uh, my my biggest concern was you know I want us to be as accurate as possible. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I hear you. So can. Uh, sorry, I just want to go back. So the secondary piece of this is that if you actually then, and I know we're going to talk about it later, if you actually look at the bond rating um, document that we received, mm -hmm. there's some very telling statements within that regarding debt and our capacity. Even though we may have excess capacity for additional debt, there was some cautionary statements within the bond rating talking about increased debt uh, that we need to consider, as well as increasing our reserves. You know, that I thought were very they're all, they're all say, yeah, Well, but they were talking about the fact that we may need to move ourselves to that next level where we increase substantially our amount of our reserves and we might be just a little too low at 8.3 or even at 10% if I read it right. But I think we need to move that up incrementally. I think, yeah. be, I think it wouldn't be wise, in my opinion, to put such a high target that we can't attain that's out of our reach. I think showing steady progress and living within our policy limits and then up in the bar again. Uh, like we just uh, that bodes very well with the rating agency that it shows positive direction and progression. Or, or, and, or oh, sorry, uh, okay. 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 Well, I mean, my concern would be that we would sacrifice operational efficiencies or operational needs in order to attain that goal of having an X percentage right. in, in in cash reserve, and we'll forego funding programs and, and policies that you know might be critical. And, and to get started, I think the 125 percent, particularly in number four, even the. 15% and 6 I think that's a reasonable start, starting point in which we then can, you know, analyze where we are after a year. Um, I think if you look at the debt schedule that we currently have, we're going to be extremely comfortable within both of those metrics based upon the population of the town. I think on the rating, uh, if you look at the amount of room we have above where our current rating is and what it's going to take for us to move incrementally in those few steps above, 
it's going to take uh, a lot of effort for lien reward, I might suggest. I mean, I mean in, in the actual... Yeah, right, an, an additional rate. rating from yeah, Moody's. Yeah. Uh, what does that going to actually mean to us in you know, better financing costs? So, yeah. Um, there's a, a risk reward that ought to be analyzed there. Yeah, but the other side of this, and I agree with the conversation after side of this, even though we have room, even though we have the ability to pay, and even though we may have the value, the other thing we do need to be sensitive about, whatever our ability to pay is, there's also, we may be bumping up against people's willingness to pay. So we just need to keep okay. that keep that in focus. Uh, and I think we're starting. So can we move this by suggesting maybe well, yeah. before, well, a couple of things. If, well, if, would you be willing to discuss whether you want to keep an um, external assessment comparison and then uh, direct me as to how you would like me to build you a cohort? Well, yeah, I was just trying to get the first. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to get the first. I thought we were skipping forward. <laughs> no, the next no. On the no, no, no. I was just trying to. Yeah. So can you find a way to incorporate in, in listening to the conversation going back, back and forth? It sounds like there's greater comfort with the hard stop being around number three. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can still keep four our dashboard and other things four and five. I think I'm a little different place than Sean and maybe Chris can be the deciding sort of voice. Mm -hmm. um, you had suggested tweaking these percentages so they all kind of line up to about the same number. I, no, I said that they currently do line up to the right. same number. Well, well, the fifteen percent, the the. The 125. The 125 would need to be in yeah. order. Would need to knock down to 115. Yeah. So that's all I'm saying. So the the rest of these kind of line up and vector us all to a similar place. But the hard, but the language will be, the the guiding sort of bar will be number three. Okay. Does that make sense to yes. everybody? Everybody comfortable with that? Yeah. Sean. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ben. Ben, you can go to number five. Sorry okay. about that. No. Okay. Um, do, well, before we do that, do you want me to, in the next draft, do you want me to, so that the, we're not suggesting a number that is in contrast, that contradicts a different measure, do you want me to, in number four, make that 115% instead of 125%? Yeah, I think so. That's, whatever the number turns out to be that lines it up. But you did a quick calculation. I'm comfortable with it. I will suggest, and this is, um, you know, um, grammar is important, so I would really strongly suggest that the word will should be changed to may. Is that the change? So well, that's what we're talking about with the hard stops. Right. That's, that's the language and the, and the tone. I so think. New, new debt issuance may be discouraged if the new debt results in a debt per capita exceeding 115% rather than it will be. Okay. Because that needs to be the will of the council. So in number three, though, do you want me to keep the language since that's the stronger yes. emphasis? That one's yes. going to say will be, yes. but the others will shift to may. Yes. Yeah. Four and six should be may, three should be will. Three is still the control. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. All right, so for number five, for that's to compare to other communities. What's your pleasure as far as how to build a cohort? Did we end up with a cohort that we're using consistently for the schools? We have a, um, the schools have identified what they call as an aspirational cohort, and then they also have a, I don't know what the word that they use as the other one. Um, I, I think that there is, I would, I would caution us that what you want to see, we want everyone to read at the same level. We want everyone, right? That there's a there's a difference, I think, in assessing a cohort for outcomes at a school versus mm -hmm. um, debt levels for a community. So I I think Scarborough is unique enough with its valuation base and with the percentage of its valuation base that is in the commercial and industrial sector compared to um, I think that in the full cohort for the for the schools they included community like um, Buxton and Dayton. Those would be a very odd choice for us to compare ourselves with in some ways, just because of the way that those towns are, are shaped, right? So, um, but that's, again, that's really a policy decision that you guys will have to, to make. And I've just tossed out some suggestions of how you could think about it. Um, and it can be entirely geographic, which I think is really what the school was looking at. Well, I can, I can speak a little bit to the cohort, the school cohort, because I was involved with part of that. Um, 
so there were there were there were really two issues. The first issue was comparing the spending per town. So you're looking at similar town populations, uh, it's student populations, and similar tax bases. Um, that was the aspirational cohort because you're looking at the outcomes that Cape Elizabeth Yarmouth found for achieving, and then you're trying to gauge what you're doing against that. Right. Then they they went out and did an independent study, or had the the uh, Muskies or something yeah, come yeah, in and yeah. came up with a more analytical or statistical yeah. analysis of a set based on needs in the community. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So and and then of course there was the the outliers of people saying, well, I have family in Sanford and they do it differently, so why don't we look at Sanford too? What we're doing. So I, I mean I. I I would agree with 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 the staff that you know basing it on the school cohort probably isn't the isn't the right That's approach right. because it's, I think their their needs are a little different or their they, what they're looking at is probably a little different than ours. But I, I like the way that they went and did it. Yeah. So I mean from from I guess maybe from my perspective, um, I, I think it's important to keep it in Maine because there's I mean you know there might be similar valuations and populations in Massachusetts, but their laws are different or their their ability yeah. to tax is going to be different than ours. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I agree it should be a main cohort. Uh, so, yeah, I think keeping it, and I think um, in, from my perspective, population and assessed valuation, which we already kind of know where it's going to probably limit us to Cumberland County and York County. Um, I, I mean, I, Bangor and Lewiston, I think, are, are might be some outliers, and I don't necessarily know if that's a good comparison because of the to Tom's point yeah. before about their infrastructure might be a little bit more right. developed. Developed population and valuation. We're in rarefied air, frankly. Uh, from a population point of view, we're eight or nine, and only going to get closer to the you know lower. Yeah. And valuation, we're three, and yeah. two is probably within our reach at some point in the future. So there's just uh, there's a very small group. If those are kind of the defining characteristics we're looking at. And the drop in valuation is steep. So yeah. we're very close with South Portland and York, but then the drop from there is it happens quick. So how many how many cohorts do we need to have to have a, a realistic comparison? If we're in rarefied air with three or four other communities, is that enough for us to, to gauge against? I mean, I mean, I guess maybe to Sean's point, what do we want to accomplish with the, the comparison? Do we want to do we want to look and see how they're managing their resources and their tax base and and see how we compare, or are we looking to see, you know? Well, we can equalize a little bit, so one of the things that we could do is we could look and see if we can find a cohort that we match well with, with things like, um, this is where I'm going to sound like I'm reversing my opinion on per capita, but if we were to look at things like valuation per capita, or we were to look at um, per capita median household income. So there are, some, there are some metrics that we get, and again, with both of those things, they're going to have the same challenges as far as the timeline of them. We can only get them when the census data is fresh. But we could construct a cohort where we somehow equalize the the, pop, the the numbers because we have such a small sample to work with. If we want to stay in Maine, then we are going to have to be creative in how we find partners. Could we do it based on number three, where we looked at total debt as a percentage of state valuation, if that's what we're going to use as our hard stops? <coughs> I mean, I don't know what kind of analysis that would entail of looking at other communities. But that, that would, to me, that would mean if, if that's what we're looking at for hard, that's, that's the outcome. What does the external place give you? I don't know. I know. I know. Well, I know. I think, I think, first. I think the, at least one of the, the problems I always struggle with is, you know, valuation reflects property that you own. We already know in some cases in Scarborough, people have inherited mm -hmm. places on the coast that have huge value, but they may not have a great ability to pay unless we force them out. You had mentioned some type of metric about median income. That starts to give you a sense of what debt are we putting on households and their ability to meet that debt. Um, and so that's one measure. That may not be the only measure, but it really, that gives us a better sense of even though we the, the property values have the capacity to carry more, what are we doing to people? Or the debt carry is up the case of household in Yeah, yeah. And that's another. Uh, yeah. Isn't that what six intends to do? That's, it, it does. It's looking internally. So the CPAIR study that the school conducted, they was really actually a neat piece of statistical work. So they had a number of different variables that they then weighted, and they found their cohort based on they said. Um, so when they looked across, each of those variables were weighted and they were added up to a score and they chose the cohort based on the total score. Mm -hmm. So what I, it's going to take a little time, I can't promise you that I'll have it done by the time that you want to meet again, but I can try, is we could, if, if you wanted to, I could 
come up with, let's say, eight measures, between five to eight measures. Put them in with a list of communities that we very often use in the state of Maine, most of Cumberland County, some of York County. Mm -hmm. Weight them across, come up with a score at the end, and we could try to find a cohort of 10 communities that have that highest score that match us. So it's going to take into account per capita income or median household income. Um, and I also would argue that we want to look at the age of our community, that if, we, if you're a community that is, so our median age is 48, if we probably don't really want to be comparing ourselves to any community that has a median age of 38. Is there one in Maine? <laughs> there <laughs> in Maine. So that's one option. Um, Up north. Or 68. Yeah, I, I sense Larissa's enthusiasm. I mean, this is in her, this is in her wheelhouse, and I, it also sounds like a PhD dissertation potentially. So I, I simply ask, yeah. to what end? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I have no doubt that Larissa has a talent, and we have the data to be able to construct this. Uh, but it will take a fair amount of work and then constant attention in the future. So right. I just want to make sure we're doing this. It's going to produce good. It's going to be worth the effort. I guess. I mean, I think it's a fair question. I don't. I mean, I, it's always nice to, to have something to compare to to say, you know, to try and have an apples to apples discussion of, you know, what are we doing well and what are, you know, what can we be doing better. But um, I know, you know, Sean and I have had those discussions on many levels, even from the school perspective. Of Scarborough has its has its its own circumstances that you know aren't always. There are. I don't know if there are communities that are apples to apples. I think uh, Larissa's uh, statistical approach is probably the easiest way to homogenize everything and I think that's probably why the Muskie school went that way. Um, but I still, I mean, I don't know what, I, I'm, from a policy standpoint, I don't know what we would, what would we achieve by that. Would, would because we, we probably have a pretty good idea of what those cohorts are going to look like. Is it simply a benchmark? I mean, why yes. do we actually care if Falmouth is 10,000 we'll people? Totally yeah. agree. Yeah. Maybe it's, if we're 12, then we should say, hey, something's out of whack, let's take a step back and see if we can understand it. I mean, that's the best I think would come out of this, right? It's just kind of an indicator. I, I totally agree. I don't think it needs to be a policy statement, but I would like to see it as a reference point or a benchmark or something that is taken into consideration so that we know where we are in comparison to a peer group and what that peer group is. Some might suggest Falmouth isn't a good uh, good comparison because of their debt structure. They don't carry a whole lot of debt because they carry huge amounts of uh, fund balance. But twenty million. Over twenty million dollars. They actually have a higher debt per capita than you do though. Ding 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 ding. Well, they just they, they just took out nineteen million in November. That's right. So. I was going to say they took uh, out a huge amount. So, so I think the answer. There are a couple questions on the table. I think I, I hear Sean. I you know I don't think it necessarily has to be part of a policy. I think yeah. I think it is a good dashboard. I, I think I think absolutely. we do need to, and especially with some of the other dashboard metrics you have, where median incomes in Scarborough are going down. Or they were, right? Very. There's a, the, they're flat. Okay. The cha and my bigger concern was the, the increasing difference between the mean and the median right. of the So I think, I think as a dashboard, it would be helpful if, and I, I hear your enthusiasm on how much work that takes. It will be, but, it will be, and honestly, it is budget season. This might be a great summer project when things are a little quieter. I think it is. You haven't gone through a budget of discovery yet, have you? Yeah. Get <laughs> yeah. your mittens out. Yeah. yeah, and not this budget. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <optimistic>. <laughs> but Tom, I think to answer your question, I think, the, and, and I think we do have to be sensitive and be able to have, answer two questions. And it, now it, it's really turning. The, the, the most common metric that our constituents can find is debt per capita. So I think I think we've addressed this in here, and it, okay. yep. with all your limitations and everything else, but yep. that's fair their enough. first yep. frame of reference. Yep. Fair so that's a useful benchmark to say, here's where we are. Yep. I think the second question we're going to have to deal with increasingly is, what is our town's ability to pay? And so I think, however you do that, with that we can have a dashboard that we can at least factor that into our decision making, or the future council's decision making. I agree with Shaw, it doesn't necessarily have to be a policy statement. I think we've got the controls in place. But I think it is an important totally placeholder. Totally agree. So so from I guess then from a from a, an administrative perspective, I mean, you know, getting it off the ground is going to take some time and then evaluate I mean, you have to run that analysis basically every time. It's not something you just plug data into and run with it. Do we want to say do we want to put in there that, you know, it's a it's a, a calculation that's done every three years or we do it every year, it sounds like it's going to be 
I want to make sure that, I, that everyone's talking about the same thing. My question was related to this kind of external look, number five. Yeah, the cohort. Okay. Right, but if she has I think to, the other metrics are readily available and prepared. Will be part we of the process yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is the one that's going to take some yeah. for the work. Yeah. Right, but, but and that was to Lewis's point. Okay. I mean, she's going to do a statistical analysis and come up with a grading scale. Do we ask her to do that every year, or do we want to look at it and say we do a snapshot every several, two or three years, or whatever, to see kind of where we're at yeah. as just a, as a reference point? I, I guess I would maybe think have her go through it the first painful time. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. And if it takes her four weeks and a day or something, then yeah, every three years. If, if it's pretty easy to do, then maybe an annual snapshot or something. Because the dashboards you said annual, right? Yeah, somewhere yeah. Online. yeah. I just think you have to evaluate every town the same way every year because the metrics will change and that's you do the full statistical analysis. In theory, every year. I'd be able to build a spreadsheet so that anyone that's else could do it too. Right. So right, yeah. they'd be able to populate fields and, and, and it would crank out numbers for you. So, so if I'm looking at this right on page 20, which is all the numbers, so number five is not in the current policy. No. Correct. Okay. Uh, a question is, at what point time frame of the year would you want this information? Yesterday. Assuming we've already got this in place, is it something before the budget? Is it in the spring when we bond? Is it... You're in. I mean, is there a time frame for when you would find this to be most effective? It's pre-budget. Yeah. Uh, after, after audits are complete, yeah. so yeah. January. February. Yeah. Yeah. February is probably the ideal time. Mm -hmm. If anything, it should be part of the audit conversation. It should be a document that's prepared for both the school board and the council. Why don't we just give us ourselves a little flexibility to say that in the first quarter of the yeah. year yeah. we'll provide the dashboard update? I mean, actually, flipping ahead, that was one of the auditor's findings, right? They, Wanted us to take a look at that policy. Actually, I, it was several policies. It wasn't just that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, we good? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um, the only other thing I had just just two things. Um, so, it, as it is budget season, there are a couple things in here on page. Oh yeah, I had edit, I had a bunch of edits inside. Yeah. Okay. Right. No, no, go ahead. Right. You first. You first. I just didn't, just, want, didn't want to close it out. So. combination thereof. So the language seems to suggest that, and that, that was what we intended it to read. I don't know if we need to do something with it. And just what do people think? I think the appropriation piece means that we don't generally do this unless there's an appropriation from the, you know, as part of the budget process. Right or wrong, the interpretation, and I'll use this for my 10 years of tenure, but I, I, we can go back to Barnstein, who's mm -hmm worked with this for 40 years, but uh, the trigger is a general obligation of security, which is a specific thing. Uh, it's likely that even lease financing doesn't qualify. That's not a GO bond. And it is, um, it doesn't apply to the other ones. So right or wrong, that's been the consistent interpretation right along. And we can't change that without a charter commission. Correct. So we can't edit that or amend it in any way, shape, or form. Can you provide us with, I know that you've had an idea that we can you just provide the council with the finance committee a copy of the legal from Bursi and Sherwood? Yeah, those have been around specific projects. Does it require voter approval or doesn't? But uh, yeah, I can dig up some I know that legal business. Uh, but Chris is quite right. If you want to change this, this is beyond charter your control as a committee yeah. and a council. It's the uh, charter commission and the voters have to approve it. I think the language, I think people read that different ways, which I think is what's causing us some of it. So. Well, I think once we have, I, I, and understood, and, I, and I'll, even if it's there might be some, some questions, yeah. but I think once we have the legal ruling, yep, that's it. <laughs> right? I mean, until well, you change it. Until we change, right. Yeah. Right. And, right. And then the only other two things which are really just as we approach budget season, and I don't know what you want to do with it, but in here there's specific language around, you know, creating different reserves, and there's an equipment reserve and other things. So I have uh, page 32. That's the last page. Reserve funds. And, you know, so I mean, this gets the earlier comment about, you know, we have an obligation to make sure we have adequate operating reserves and equipment reserves. So if this language stays in here, you know, and I'm not sure it's a topic for tonight, but do we want to then start putting a placeholder in budgets that we start, as you suggested, Tom, we incrementally build towards the reserves that we want? 
So do we add something to the budget each year that we just it just becomes a budgeted item expense um, for both of these things? So I just I don't know if we need to decide that tonight. The language is in here, so I think we need to make either we strike the language or we do something different with it, or we make just a conscious decision about because I think what happens the budget gets tight and we don't we don't do it. If if this is our intent, then. Talk about I also think the budget gets tight because of the, either the perceived or actual will of the town to support the budget as a whole. So my con I, my only concern would be, you know, we get into a situation where we, if we if we put hard stops in for equipment and we need a new plow truck, for example, um, and we don't have the capital to do that, do we do we go down a plow truck and not plow the roads, or do we how do we, you know are we limited? Do we, can we still bond it, or can we do we you know what I'm saying? Is it yeah, no, I don't think it's a hard stop. But I okay. think it's more of a discipline mm -hmm. that we're going to set aside. And even if I have to build a certain, if it's in here, it's important that we honor it. Yep. If we don't want to honor it, then I guess my point was, do we strike it? So I, I, it's really okay. that's really the decision on yeah. one. Yeah, but, and I, thought, I thought we started earlier too. We were going to try it on, a, on maybe one or two projects. Yeah. I thought we were going to think about that for the next budget cycle to see how we. I mean, we talked about it a little bit. I can. We never finalized on it. Someone suggested was it was it the Marjorie de Sanctis plan with the yeah? You used depreciation. Yeah, depreciation. Right. But that's right. a big number. That's a big number. <laughs> well, it would be it would be a big number <laughs> if we did it if we did it time <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But you know, do we do we you know do we do we take smaller steps yeah. to try and build that that acceptance into the budget or toward the same end, the same discipline um, would be required to convert how you fund your capital projects from right. uh, from mm -hmm. right financing to uh, appropriations. So, so I guess the question on the table for just as a, as a debt policy, mm -hmm. do we think it's still a good idea that these stay in and then it's the will of the finance committee and the council as a whole body about what they decide to do each year? Yes. You're right. Historically, we've not budgeted to fund these reserve accounts. Yeah. Um, your fund balance policy has, when you reach your threshold, if there's anything in excess, goes to capital. So that's historically how we've tended to fund these. We've not budgeted monies year over year as a matter of discipline. But but if, but if your point is that if we really are committed to getting it to from eight three three to eight nine to where we want to be. Hard to do that. Yeah, but an easier way is it's just that becomes a line under budget, we gotta balance with every other decision we're making as a transitional year um, this may see the tax rate. Yeah, yeah, and I think I the, the that's dynamics that's are tough because we're raising we're raising the limits on our expectations for fund balance. So we're expecting to put more money into reserves, and we're expecting to put more operational budget into into capital expenditure, and we're expecting to do you know more equipment depreciation type of funding. So I, I, are we biting off more than well, no, two in one spot? Or? Well, yeah, it may be. I mean, there, I think there are two different discussions. One. Yeah. Just this is a policy discussion, so yeah. I think the only conversation tonight is: is it worthy still having it in our policy? And if the answer is yes, we keep it, and then we have additional conversations as a finance committee about how we get there. Or no, we're not going to ever do this. We might as well take it out of the policy. So, or, or couch them as more aspirational yeah. without being specific as to how you actually fund it, whether it's well, I mean these. These are more aspirational, right? These are kind oh, of the ten-year things in that yeah, second. Well. I, I would I would support the aspirational, and we can just continue. I mean, that's that's something we can put on for a more detailed discussion about. Because I think you're right. I think it, it involves more than a five-minute discussion of thumbs up or thumbs down. I think mm -hmm. throughout this policy, as well as some others, we have these benchmarks or these uh, these policy statements. So if you look at page 12 under local debt limit, um, so I'm fairly certain that we need those. We've never received a report that suggests that we are either in compliance or not in compliance. And I think that if we're going to have statements like these two fund balances, as well as these, that there needs to be an annual report that says, this is your policy, this is what your limit is, and are you in compliance? So if we're going to have that, um, you know, I'd like to see, I, I don't mind keeping these in here to the conversation, the approval process of the new policy. Um, I'd like to see what the impact is if we're not in compliance. There is an just well, no, the, the impact is, you know, um, to be in compliance, how much would it take us? Oh, where, where are we today and how much would it take to get us in the back? For these two. 
Uh, these two. But even, in, you know, so if you look at page 12, which has to do with debt limits, you know, school purposes, 5%, you know, where are we if we're at... Um, I think that's one of the, well, that's I think that's one of the handouts. Is it somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe not. Okay. But if it's, but what I'm saying is, so wherever yeah. there is a metric in here that needs to right. be measured, you could do a compliance sheet that simply says, here are the metrics, this is where you are, and are you in compliance or not? So what, on page 12, I've been trying to get into the audit, I'm not sure I actually did it this year either, but uh, one of the goals is on one of statistical tables is to have And if you're not in compliance, then what would it take to be in compliance from a monetary perspective since it's financial? Yeah, that reporting could be done as part of the annual uh, right. dashboarding. Yep. Yep. So I think, personally, I think keeping it in for now, um, and then we can look at it. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we can do that. I'm good with that. You can answer. You, you had other stuff? I, I, a lot of it's mostly housekeeping, so we right. can either zip through it quickly or I can just give you my sure. suggestions and we can. I would, I would recommend you transfer those suggestions. Yeah, if you want to just substitute. Um, it, uh, I guess maybe one substantive change on the introduction. I, 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 I thought this was a little bit harsh. Um, on the second paragraph, yeah. None of the indicators found in this policy alone or in combination shall be used to make decisions on fiscal policy. I guess maybe I just read that wrong because I just want it as the sole basis for making decisions, but that's that's fine. That's, that's fine. That's, yeah, that's not substantive. Um, I don't think there was. Uh, no, I think everything else was just word smithing. No, I'm good. So we'll, I'll, I'll transfer we'll take yeah. under advisement and incorporate the report we received tonight. Those changes come back to you with yet again another draft. And trust Mr. Kiazzo's recommendation. So I sense that you're getting to the point first. closer to the point. I think so. Yeah. Yes. And thank you for your patience. Nice work. Thank you. Right. So I, I would, um, if it's appropriate, I would make a motion that uh, we accept the recommendations with the um, edits uh, that Mr. Kiazzo's uh, recommending that we full, that the chair uh, forwards it to the full council for consideration. If you want, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys copies of the ads. I'll just scan them in. That was in the form of a motion. Second. All in favor? Well, first time, just, just as an FYI, I think when we put those the, the policy together, I know it's hard to read, um, I essentially pulled them out of the air to read. That would be something we would discuss during the finance and yep. the council level. And I see this before, so I apologize. But it, that's exactly the right. approach. Right. Actually, Ruth, what you should have said was, you know what, I hadn't thought of that, and here you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on sale update. Yes, I did provide council um, to, get, for able to, to look through the um, summaries from each rating agency. Uh, essentially, the hook notes are that uh, our ratings were affirmed in each case. Um, I thought. Uh, the commentary that went along with that, particularly the outlook section, and maybe some of the cautionary notes were really good information to review and, and uh, be sensitive to going forward. Um, just thinking back to your discussion just moments ago, it seems to me that's really being aware of and you know what these agencies think is important is, is a real important part of this. And then of course our residents ability to pay is equally important. But above all that's really something we've got to be educated on and aware of and working for. Uh, so very pleased to have that and I appreciate uh, the participation of uh, at least two members of finance that were part of those reading calls. It was helpful, it was interesting, it was instructional. It's hard not to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did go to sale and uh, the bonds were awarded to Hilliard and company. Uh, the rate was 3.203646. Was that about what we wanted it to be? Or? Slightly more than I had hoped. Yeah. Um, I think we modeled uh, both the 3% and 3.5%, uh, so it's kind of in the ballpark. We've certainly seen better rates in the past. Uh, there's just some interesting things going on in uh, the, going the markets as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, every one of these deals, and this is a trend that I don't think will be reversed, but uh, included sizable bid, uh, bond premium as part of the bids. And we don't have the ability to kind of negotiate and say we don't want this or reduce it. Um, it's a trend, and, and Joe Patera can explain what, why they're making that part of their bids. Uh, the, this uh, this uh, low bidder had a bond premium of about $1.3 million. So we had in about 20 minutes to decide which bid we're going with and how we wanted that bid premium to be used. 
and being mindful of our experiences with Wentworth, this bid premium for that deal was three, over three million, uh, given just the size of it. We wanted to make sure we're using it wisely. So um, there should be a sheet like this in your packet. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I uh, direct your attention to the bottom of the sheet. That three, 1.341 in, in uh, bid premium was used kind of three different ways. One, it re we reduced the total borrowing from 15 million to 14.265, so we reduced it by 7.35. We paid cost of issuance, and then we're covering the uh, November 18 interest payment uh, as well. And I certainly would have included you in these considerations if time allowed. I think we honestly had 20 minutes to uh, work okay, through this and find a, a system that works. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think there's a lack of uh, knowledge. What's the alternative to what you select? I have no idea. So uh, I don't even know what it could have. Uh, we could have used more of it toward uh, interest expense. So it's just reallocating within those three groups? Yeah. Oh, okay. We really wanted to make sure that we were not borrowing any more than we needed, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the good news with this is there'll be a second, much smaller piece of borrowing that we'll consider uh, this time next year. So um, we'll have to be mindful of yeah. how this all shook out. So even though the public safety building shows here is fourteen million two sixty five, that's all we borrowed for it. We can still spend the full fifteen million because that of the seven thirty five that we used towards the project. Um, you might be interested to know what effect this will have on annual debt service cost. Uh, current debt service in FY18, and this is a sheet that I'll just pass over now. This is kind of high level. It's about the extent of my abilities. But the top line there is our current annual debt service cost of uh, 10.3 million. Next year, with the, this borrowing, uh, we'll see it rise to 10.6. So I've got a $300,000 additional debt service expense to contend with in the, in the upcoming budget. And then you'll see it picks up and it levels off and then starts to drop fairly precipitously, you know, six, seven years out. And obviously, there's a lot of things that will happen between now and then in terms of annual borrowing considerations. Uh, I'm hopeful that we don't have any big capital projects uh, in that kind of horizon. I think we. As I look at this debt schedule, I think we need to get out into the 2024-25 time frame where there's some significant debt being shed uh, before we consider taking on, the, you know, significant additional debt again. To win, uh, well, if you look there where you see the, the you know, kind of the 2023, it's at 10.1, then it jumps down to 9.5, and then it's a big jump the next step down. Yeah. So. This is, needs to be hand in glove and kind of dovetailed with our long range facility plan. And as we talk about future needs, particularly the high dollar value future needs, we need to be mindful of these sorts of opportunities um, show, so we don't you know, have huge peaks and valleys right. in our debt service. Right. If we can level that out, that will help keep our tax rate predictable and consistent and not as volatile. So we know debt is, the, uh, is one of the tails uh, wagging the dog. We're likely to get pressure before 2023 20, or 2024. Even if this is committed already, there's nothing we can do for us. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, before you. the next, before the next, the next project. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, and there'll be experience between now and then that will change these numbers. But it, based on what we know today, yeah. uh, we could frankly model in what our typical annual borrowing is um, to, to model that out further. But I think. Even if we did that, you'll see it the same sort of uh, drop off in debt service expense. And every year, uh, Morrison Cabot does a, a review of all of these to see if there are any that can be, you know, not I can't refunded, but regular refunded. Yeah. And that will adjust these numbers as well. So that might be helpful to kind of put on the horizon or to get some expectations out to our colleagues and constituents in terms of when is our ability to advance these big expensive projects. Uh, I think getting some clarity around and timeline around that I think is going to be a really important part of the conversation. I mean, this might be a good conversation for the Joint Finance Committee. Sure. Absolutely. When time permits. It's about managing expectations. Yeah. Yeah. 
we might have a crisis that requires us to do something sooner. Right? But to the extent that we can plan for the future, let's let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, guys? Okay, good. We're good. Thank you. Audit uh, management letter. Yeah, this is my pet peeve. <laughs> great job. Yeah. You wouldn't have great job. Um, essentially, the uh, auditors have found two items. They characterize them as kind of the lowest threshold, more kind of best practices, or certainly not material weaknesses. And your auditor will introduce those. But we thought we'd take the, the opportunity just to show you what they, what they are. Um, the first one, I honestly think that the auditors looked, I know they looked at our website and saw the last revision date on the policies and said, boy, it's been a while since you looked at that. Or, so I, I don't know if it's any more complicated. I met with the auditor. He didn't have any substantive comments as to it's lacking here or there. Uh, <coughs> he looked at the last revision date and said it's time to look at this stuff. So um, some of these, I think, are right in your wheelhouse. Other ones might uh, also make a stop at ordinance, potentially. The administrative code and such. Um, and actually, I think investment policy is not part of the. Right. Yeah, we just. Yeah. So we scored on that one. Yeah. And then Ruth, um, I guess. The purchasing policy, there's a purchasing policy after ordinance, I don't know which is, it's um, the town's ordinances. We also have an internal policy, and I think that's the one they're kind of referring to. And I think they're probably bringing it up mostly in, in uh, connection with the new uniform guidance. It used to be the old 133 for grants and things. So the federal government changed how all of that works and we need to update some of our internal. Would anything, would anything change with the addition of staff now that we're kind of trying to consolidate purchasing with that? No, I think it's a, a decent, it's, it's an important policy that it's high time to look at it. I, um, you know, we've got staff to make sure we're adhering to it, so that's first and foremost. Yeah. Um, so from our perspective, we're tickled that that's the extent of oh, yeah. the comments. Oh, no, yeah, that's great news. And I'm trying to look for the schools, uh, again, he'll go through this in detail, but I think it's... Tell us what the schools are. Yeah, and so like food nutrition related kind of a petty cash. It's always and the same. They were all the deficit balance. Yeah, they were all, all, the yeah, they're all kind of yeah. Of, yeah. Same, yeah. same best practices. It's, no, yeah. it's, it's, it's been a common for the twenty years I've been around. And it was only twenty six thousand in the past. That fund deficits anywhere is up, maybe sometimes up around a hundred thousand. I did want to ask a question, and if you can't answer it, I respect that. So if I look at the school's audit letter, it did mention that responses to some of the questions had not been answered. To the schools? Yeah, to the schools. Any management responses to some comments? Oh. Do you know if anything was supplemental that may have come after? Yeah, I haven't seen anything. Okay. Um, we are planning on having a joint workshop <coughs> with the Board of Education on March 1st. It's actually yeah. one of them before their regular uh, board, monthly board meeting. Um, so yeah, that's a good question to raise yeah, there. Have a, have a but the auditor will make the presentation jointly to both bodies. Okay. So it's total clean bill of health, except for these items. The first item we've addressed, the other two are in process. Yeah, policy related. Yeah. Yep. I think the last two years there have been only some minor policy, minor procedural issues regarding cash handling or some type of accounting thing. So that, that's the next that was all cleaned up. And in terms of performance, um, as was mentioned earlier, we added uh, $700,000 to fund balance yeah. in that order. Yeah. Good news. Okay. All right, budget review process and schedule. This is where we wanted to talk about just maybe an abbreviated schedule of your team presenting. Last time we talked, you're going to check with who liked to come in, eat grilled, and go through that, and who who was stressed. I'm not going to name names. Okay. <laughs> no. no, I think I honestly, I I beg your pardon. I'm not giving thought to an alternative approach. Yep. Um, we're pleased and prepared. Colette's actually put, put together a, a very typical schedule, if you will, um, heavy through the month of April. Right. That would bring everyone in front of you. And we're prepared to do that. I was just observing, and I think I heard from many of you individually, that uh, given how well healed you are with budget issues, you may not need that level of review. 
I will say after 26 years doing this, there's always, always an educational piece that comes out of it, yeah. whether you're the beneficiary of that and someone watching at home. Um, so we're prepared to certainly go through that process again, but uh, we want to be as efficient on your time and uh, you know, focus on the things that you think are important and real drivers as opposed to simply trotting everyone in front of you. What do you say? I agree. I think that we're finally at a point where we've, I mean, I remember sitting through this and you literally go line item by line item, and these are $100 line items to a million dollar line items. So I think that we've come a long way. I personally would like to hear, even if it's from all of the departments, you know, what's the big picture? What is their focus on program, uh, either program enhancements or, you know, sustainable programming, you know, keeping what we currently have? What are those challenges? Um, and I don't necessarily need, like, to the specific dollar to me, you know, it's, not, it's just rounded. Yep. You know, um, and, and where are we trying to take it, you know, whether it's public safety, community services. I think, though, I do want to understand a little bit, um, not to get it, <laughs> it's been my pet peeve for you. Community services, I've always been a focus on the fee structure because I think that it, that it could be fully funded by itself. Um, so that might be a little bit different, but the rest of them I'd like to see. And I'm not, and by the way, when I talk about community services, I'm not talking, I don't need to know whether, you know, soccer is going to be $35. I, I want to, what's the total in there? What's the percentage in comparison? You know, that type, that type of Well, I can encourage you to have to be prepared for that kind of high-level introduction if you want to drag them back to the line yeah, or right. a question, so be it. But uh, many of them fall back to the routine of kind of having a structure and presenting mm -hmm. appropriations and the revenues and providing comments on each. I think we can probably short-circuit that. Yeah. So I think yeah. really focus on the big picture. You know, and I, I, would, I would like to have a conversation, too, about how do we determine program value and where we're taking the program. So, you know, community services, how do we determine what services do we provide and what activities? I mean, do, are, have, have we ever done a community survey based upon, you know, what is it that you want from our school department, not our schools, but from our police department, or what is it that you want? The, the beauty of community services is it's largely user fee based, yeah. and we get a pretty quick indication that people yeah, aren't yeah. paying, are blocking at the fee, we're not signing up all together, we get pretty immediate reaction as to whether or not they like it. Whereas tax supported, it's harder to get a sense of that, right? Yeah, but I mean, even if you talk about infrastructure, um, you know, improvements, how do we determine which road gets attention as part of the budget? How, you know, to kind of talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's my cap. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, uh, and, and, you know, I don't need statistical data. I just need to understand how they're determining in their budget process that long term vision. Because that goes into the whole forecasting of the budgeting process. Um, we need to understand it before we set numbers to a longer, longer range budget. How long the comprehensive plan process takes? I mean, I think that will kind of guide us towards where yeah. long-range planning is getting ready to jump in. I think they're here back in consultants. They're getting ready to present the final. But two, two examples just came to mind because I was meeting with Mike uh, in advance of this budget coming to me. Uh, you as a finance committee and council has financed a, uh, we're televising all the underground uh, storm server mm -hmm. uh, so we can assess its condition. Mm -hmm. That's going to be really informative as to where we should spend our capital dollars going forward. It's a big investment up front, but it will give us a really good plan uh, as to where we should spend our money. Mike's also advancing the payment management system, to your point just a, a moment ago. Let's understand where those dollars should go, not to the one who's complaining the loudest or the most. Um, no, but I think it needs to be clear because, you know, people, people want to know why, um, you know, what is it, the, the 114 going up to eight corners was selected and where it is currently in its phase, as well as why was Pine Point selected. Is that the way, that's that's the way I drove home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I, you know, I, I just think it needs, that part of it needs to be communicated as part yeah. of the budget so that people understand. Yeah, sure. I, I will say I think that transportation is looking also at doing, on those pro types of projects, having more, I want to say marketing, but, you know, having a sign up there or something that says, mm -hmm. you know, funded by... You just split DOT or something. Something that's you know, kind of like your tax dollars at work kind of thing. Of this is these are kind of a, uh, so they're looking at the kind of issue. I, I mean, I guess from my perspective, from, I, I liked the, the 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 style that we did last year, where we had that kind of summary. First summary page was the executive summary, um, you know, and and I think that was fairly descriptive. And I don't think it's necessary to call people in front of us to just repeat what's written down there. Right. Um, so maybe we, you know, from my perspective, we we take a look at those, and if we have specific departments or questions 
you know, maybe then we decide that you know, we want to dig a little deeper, dive a little deeper. Um, unless, of course, I don't want to discourage, and if somebody wants to get up and plead their case, then I certainly think we should make well, time for it. Well, I think we a little structure to it. I mean, some provided that high-level overview, other ones kind of drag you, not line by line, but yeah. Sort of, um, okay. I think I can provide a little more structure so there's more consistency, and then you can, you can drag it back if there's details that you want to go back into in more detail. Yes, yeah, so, so kind of, for me, I'm maybe similar place, maybe a little bit different. I think this year will be a challenging budget year, I guess. Um, because I want to talk about, too, I think we need to think about in the municipal, in our budget this year a little bit differently. One, if we are going to do the reval, that's going to be a significant line item that needs to go in. Um, and two, at some point, because of the property owner's dispute, we kind of know the minimum liability, do we do something with that? Um, so it's not all up hit to reserves at some point in time. So I, I like the format of last year. I, I like the way they said, you know, here's here's sort of, I, I'm most interested in what are the significant drivers that are, that are going up. But two, if they are specifically asking for something, maybe a little bit of tweak to the process in the past would be, what are they willing to live without? So it's always easy to keep adding on to what you do. Um, what's harder to do is, you know, if, if there's a new mission or something to be accomplished, what can they let go of? That's what we used to have to do, at least in corporate planning. It's always, you know, you always are asked to do more with less, and if you wanted something new, you had to give up something old. So have them just give that some thought. So if they really want X, what are they willing to say, you know, we want to test not doing Y? Be really hopeful. And I, and I agree with Chris. I mean, some of them were just so clean. There really mm -hmm. isn't a conversation. So maybe. I know it's a pain. Maybe schedule their time. Yeah, schedule just so it's down, and, yeah. I, and then know which ones you can spend more time on. And, and we may end up look at that and say there's no need. To My goal is to bring as many clean to you as, as possible. So we, shall, we shall see. And, and I'm not sure if this is a place to talk about it, but do we want to talk about budget goals for at least our side of the equation? Is it? I, I don't know. What, there's already a goal. Start, there's already a goal in place for the council as a whole. Well, it's under. Yeah. It's under. Three, three, three for the tax rate. For the tax rate. I don't know what that translates into. As, you know, Tom, you may have already given Well, I mean, so our modeling, it, we need to be 2% or less on the town side from an expenditure point of view to, to meet that goal. That's, I'm sorry? Did you say expenditure or did, did you net it out with the whatever revenues that I'm mindful. I think I think expenditures need to be in the order of two percent or so for us to meet that overall target, knowing what the school historically is that their needs are. Um, so that's what I'm working with at this point. I, I, yeah. My philosophy might be a little different. I, I think in terms of, um, I, I think you know, and, and it's not necessarily a popular approach, but. You know, the goal of, of having the tax policy with stability mm -hmm. so that when times are when times are, are difficult, we at least, you know, we may, when times are good, we can build a reserve up and get our reserve funds in and we, we maintain our, our, our expenditure level and obviously that's always first and foremost, that's kind of what we can control the most of. And then when, you know, when times are tough, um, if we're consistent there, then, you know, we have something that's predictable. So. I, I guess I would look at it from a, um, from you know, I mean, I, I think the process that we went through administratively worked last year. You know, maybe the outcomes weren't that great that we wanted, but I think, you know, the process of having the discussion of, you know, what 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 are the needs, what are the wants, and what do we have, <laughs> right? I mean, it's the same discussion kind of every year, and then you know we kind of got to weigh that, you know, let's let's talk about where the priorities are. I would hate to, I would hate for the municipal side to handcuff themselves because the expectation is that the schools have other issues or they have, they might have a bigger need. I mean, I can, I, I can appreciate that, but again, on the flip side of that, uh, I don't think the school is going to say, you know, we're going to handcuff us because we need three, four more fire. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying that as a, you know, not as a confrontational kind of thing. I just think that I'm, I'm very hesitant to start saying, expenditures are going to get this percentage until we really kind of know what the drivers are. So I'd almost like to start at the 50,000 foot level and say, what are our drivers? What are we looking at for for major impacts? Healthcare, those are the kind of yeah. classic ones. And 
there's anything out there that we don't know of, it'd be nice to know about that as soon as possible. And then we work around the bigger picture of the goals of where we want to be collectively as the groups, and then we kick it back to staff and say, okay, you know, here's what our parameters are. What, what do you got? What do you got? Yeah, and to some degree, I think a hybrid of that is what I think you've done prior years, Tom. You've uh, set some type of goals for your group, and then if they have a real need that they're, they're saying is really they'll come and they'll say, here's an additional ask, which kind of gets to Chris's point that here's the target. It's easier to add to the budget than it is to, to cut. So Yeah, I put the direct expectation of staff is that I don't, and I've characterized it on a net basis because some of them have some revenue component, mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, it's a fairly small impact. So 2% is the goal of sent out to all of them. To the point, Peter, there are cases where I will agree with them and Proposed to you something higher than that, and you know, provide justification. Yeah. I think in cases where they have ideas that uh, don't make the cut, I uh, encourage them to have an exhibit the budget and tell you what's not in it. And yeah. so at least yeah. that works. Whether it serves a purpose in the near term or it kind of sets the table for future discussion, uh, and I, I think they'll take advantage of that and put that in front of you. That's okay. We good. Okay. Um, and then just a quick update on reevaluation. I know. I do think, have you heard anything back from some of the business groups you were going to do outreach to? I, you saw, I saw your frequently asked questions and the letters. And yeah, let me just tell you what I've done. Of course, we only had 10 days or so to kind of yeah, yeah. sort out. Um, so in that time, we did prepare this FAQ. Melissa and the Sussex staff put that together. It did go out to 1,400 or so active email addresses that said go maintain. So it's as good a distribution list that exists in this town frankly, right. for the business community. Yeah. Uh, in it, the final FAQ kind of told them that the council would be consi uh, considering this again tomorrow night. Yeah. In the meantime, contact us. Uh, honestly, I didn't hear from a single person. Larissa took one call. She can relate the nature of that. Uh, bef before we do, uh, in addition to that, I took the opportunity at the SEDCO board meeting last Wednesday morning to mention this. Not that there was great reach in the room, but those folks, I encourage them to go out and speak to the people they associate with, make them aware of it. Uh, there was a leader article that was before that, and then I, there was a, a slide in my presentation of the community chamber Thursday night. So um, it was fortuitous to have a couple of opportunities all yeah. kind of teed up. And then I'll let Larissa describe the one input that you received. Yeah, I got one. Um one gentleman emailed me and I called him back. We had a very nice conversation. It was um, He was already fully aware of how we calculate tax rates, so half the battle was, was won there. Sure. And he was on board. He said, I understand. Yeah. He said, that's, that's reasonable. Okay. And it was a very positive yeah. conversation. I have the email. Yeah. I'm happy to share with you. I can't remember the business owner channel. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I can certainly share out the email if you'd like. And um, he, you can call him yourself. I'm interested to know if all of you received any input. I actually sought out input, one from, um, I believe, they, at least the group may be the largest uh, commercial landowner in Scarborough amongst several properties within a family, um, as well as with a commercial developer. Uh, the developer was um, very encouraged and said this is a natural course of business and it's absolutely um, imperative that this happens. Um, the, uh, the landowner, the other commercial landowner, was like, First, I didn't understand the whole issue around the tax rate, uh, which I was a little surprised with, but um, because it was automatically, um, yeah, you're going to reevaluate me. As a result of reevaluating me, my taxes are going up. Not understanding that your value goes up, but the tax rate will go down. It can only go up if you then spend more money in your next budget cycle. Um, but he kind of got it at the end. Um, and he just said basically he doesn't like it because they don't want to pay more taxes, but understands that that's a natural course of business. And he remembers when they did it the last time 10 years ago. As he said, when his property was significantly less valued. I guess I'd be I'm, I'm glad, I'm just glad. I'm, I'm, even though we're not maybe hearing the feedback, I'd be curious to know if Sitco or Chamber was getting feedback that just isn't coming our way. I didn't check in with Karen today, but I will. Okay. Yeah, uh, I good. assume if yeah. she was flooded, we would have heard it. Yeah. I got, so Karen actually, I think the email that I received was actually forwarded to me from Karen. Okay. So Karen's approach was going to be any email she received, she was going to pass them directly on. Well, I'll confirm and I'll report that tomorrow night. Yeah. That's it. Okay. There may be people that show up. Uh, yeah, right. Part of this, we made them aware of the meeting yeah. tomorrow night. Okay. Okay. I feel that the response to when we do the residential side will be significantly different. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> um, 
the future meeting dates are on here. I'm assuming folks are okay. And then the last item is just public comment. Anybody want to have a comment? I want to know what, <clears throat> what the I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. My name's Jillian. I live on Beechwood Road. I don't know what you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> that's good enough. That's, yeah, that's, that's good, good enough. Right, right, right. Close enough. Um, so, you know, I, I assume by now you all know that there are a number of issues circulating in the town. And um, I'm really worried about the, the budget cycle. Um, what that is going to mean for the number of times we have to go for a vote. And I know that doesn't necessarily directly, I'm trying to get an understanding, that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, that doesn't necessarily impact what you do in this meeting, but it probably impacts you overall when we go to vote multiple times. I know that we just are voting on the school budget, but that affects, of course, the tax rate and so on and so forth. But I want to know, you know, what, what will be What's the most number of times that we had to go to vote? Three. We had to do it twice. Mm -hmm. Three times on two separate occasions? Yeah, we yeah. just take it three times on two separate occasions. Okay. And so I guess, you know, I, I, I'm I really concerned about that this in this particular um, climate. And I, yeah. I, uh, I'm sure you all have that in mind as well. Um, but, you know, what happens... How many? What's the like? What's the limit? What what happens? Do we go ten times? You go I mean, until it's validated. Yep. There's no there's no limit. There's no end in sight. Well, I mean, if I recall last year, we also I mean, we have to set the tax rate by a certain date, and once the once the doesn't mean that we have necessarily the budget to operate under, but it means the tax rate's been set, and whether we have to go back and reevaluate it. That was a point of discussion as well last year, but. And there's, there's still a budget that's in place. It, yeah. and I'm sure we always get confused, but it's yeah. the last budget that, that comes before the council to go to the voters. So without it being ratified, whatever the last one that we you know, voted, voted to go to the polls is the budget that is in place. Okay, Just so before. in other words, the one that's in, but in uh, operation now. Correct. No, it'll be the last yeah. one that yeah. failed at the polls, yeah. essentially, is the one that... Yeah. <laughs> The okay. council will approve it's their budget in May or whatever, and then that's the budget that goes to the voters. If they come back, it fails, and they go back to the council, and the council increases or decreases the budget, that's then the that budget, budget that's the goes budget. to the voters. So it's the, the most recent one approved by the council. So there's still revenues in place, and, but but we do need to get it ratified. A, but yeah, we keep going back to the polls until that. Yeah. And our goal, I mean, everybody's goal is, uh, you know, I, I think... Everybody's concerned this is going to be, there's lots of reasons why this. Budgets are always a challenging time for us. We're really trying to do a better way. Our goal was how do we not go back to the polls three times this year? Um, I, so we, we share your concerns. Uh, and we are pretty aware of some of the, some, but there's, you know, and I guess you know, others can be, we're too autonomous sort of bodies, the town council, right. you know, we, and the board of education, they, we don't really have any, you know, authority or influence over them. They're, they're their own elected officials and bodies, and they are working through, I think, the issues you refer to. Um, yeah, that's 100%. But we share your concerns, and we, we've had, if you've seen some of our, we actually spent a lot of time in the last two years trying to get to a better place on a better, Process to not go through this because it doesn't it doesn't help the community. It's really divided and divisive. And if you have any suggestions, we're glad to hear them because we're <laughs> we're trying to find a better mousetrap. And yeah, I think that would be very Yes, you would. I, I, I want to make sure because it is being taped and this will actually be re um, re televised. So I, I hope it's clear that we have because I believe me, I hear from a lot of particularly seniors who are like, "Hey, I said I don't want." You know, um, I don't want to spend that much money. Why do you keep coming back and asking me for to approve a school budget? We are required by law to continue working on the budget until the citizens approve it. Yeah. So while we may at some point have a budget in place because we approved it and took, in order to send a tax rate, we still have to keep going back to the citizens and asking them to ratify it. 
whether that takes three, whether it takes one incident or whether it takes ten, you know, we have to by law keep going back. State law. State law. It's just state law. Okay. At considerable expense to the town. Yeah. Every time we have an election, it costs like money. Well, Forty-five thousand. None of what's going on is, is budget neutral. So. Right. Yeah. Every, every, everything has consequences and impact. And Thanks for sharing. We appreciate it. We share your concerns. So with that, actually, I just if I can make a uh, for the next um, joint finance, not the 26. It's too late for that. Um, I would because uh, we mentioned it with the bond rating agencies also. Um, I'd like to start having that discussion with the school finance about their metrics. I'd like to have them. Give us some if they you know if they share some guidelines of what they'd like to, to, to suggest as metrics because I think before we finalize this completely something will have to be in there relating to the schools because it's two thirds of the budget. So before we finalize before we finalize the policy for the, the dashboard, oh, yeah, I think yeah. you know we need to have yeah, yeah, yeah. at least some yeah. school components in there. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if it, they might take some exception to you having a policy that dictates what they do or don't do, but. I don't no. think it needs to be a policy. I think yeah. it just needs to be included. Right. It's my professional yeah. courtesy to have them included. Because that was the intent when, when Dr. Entwistle was here. I believe there were five metrics chosen by him that he posted us. us. Um, I just, they need to be included. I did want to ask as far as for future items if we could include whatever items that are included in the audit statement, <coughs> policy review, whatever is appropriate, that we also include them so that we can act on them immediately. On your agenda here? Yep. I think it's funny. Joint, that, that's just yeah, just our agenda, just regular our agenda. I just think it's funny that last year they didn't mention it, but this year now it's a concern, and they're five, six years old. <laughs> justification for the yeah, expense. justification for the expense. They have to find something. I know. Is that justified? Guys, ready to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you, everybody.